Hey guys, welcome back. Currently reporting from Hustler Casino, a familiar territory for this YouTube channel. And it's the place where I host my private games every weekend, usually Saturdays, sometimes Sundays. Today is a Sunday and we are playing some 2550 right inside this beautiful building right behind me. We're off to a great start already as I checked off a poker bucket list item by meeting Tom Dwan around 30 minutes ago. He's here for a PLO game or something, so that was a pretty cool experience. We'll see if that translates to a good night on the felt. Come with me and find out. Alright guys, here we are once more. Today we're playing 2550. Later on this game will turn into a 2550-100. But here are the cast of characters we're dealing with today. Mike X, Turbo, Nate Hill, Krish, Ling Ling, Bobo, myself, and lastly, Dylan Flashner. You guys may be familiar with some of these guys from the Hustler live stream. Perhaps not. Either way, here we go. In the first interesting hand, Mike opens from early position to 200. Nate calls in middle position, Ling Ling calls in the small blind, and I look down in the big blind at a good hand. It's ace-queen suited, the hearts variety, so I think it's worth a raise. Even though the raise came from early position with uh, Mike making it 200, the fact that there's a few callers and, you know, my hand's pretty good, I think it's okay to do this. So I kick it up to $1,400 to go. Mike thinks for a bit and calls. Nate gets out of the way, but Ling Ling does not. She calls as well. So we're going to go three ways to a flop of King Jack Nine Rainbow. Of course, not much going on for my exact holding, but given that I raised pre-flop, I can represent all sorts of stuff on a board like this. And you know, a 10 could also come, which would give me quite the good hand. And of course, an ace might be good as well. So when Ling Ling checks, I continue with a small bet of $1,200. Mike calls, but Ling Ling folds. So we're going heads up out of position to a turn card which shouldn't change anything. It's the six of hearts. Now we have a question between checking and seeing what Mike wants to do or continuing to apply pressure. And I think both options have merit, but this time I decide to continue bluffing, going with the story that I've got ace king, aces, pocket jacks, you know, some good stuff. So this time I put in $4,800. Mike thinks for quite a long time, and eventually folds. So not the biggest pot ever, but always nice to get off on the right foot. And the next one, Ling Ling opens the action to 200 from late position. I'm in the small blind with pocket sevens, and given that there's a big blind Annie, I think it's okay to call some hands from the little blind. So that's what I do. Dylan calls in the big blind, and we go three ways to a flop of five, four, deuce with a flush draw. I think sometimes leading on boards like this makes sense. Not always, but in this situation, that's what I'm gonna do. And I've got an appropriate hand to do it with, I think. So I put in $300. Dylan folds, Ling Ling does not. Turn card is the five of diamonds. And now we have a question between checking and seeing what she wants to do or continuing to bet. Once more, I think both options make sense, but I think betting is usually the better option, mostly because this board is still good for me and I would have plenty of bluffs. So perhaps getting a little bit thin for value, but I put in $1,200 and once again, she makes the call. So I think we could be ahead sometimes, could be behind sometimes, riveting stuff, right? This is some in-depth analysis, but seriously, she could have hands like two overs and a flush draw. She could also just have hands like ace king, which is two over cards and a gut shot straight draw. She might have hands like four X of diamonds, which would be a pair and a backdoor flush draw. You know, plenty of hands that we're still beating. So when she makes the call, I feel like we could still be ahead. And the river comes the four of hearts. Pot's $3,600, and should we check or should we bet? Well, I'll be the first to say, I'm actually not 100% sure in real time what the best decision is. But Ling Ling is a player who likes to call very wide, and given that all the draws missed, she might get curious with ace high since my bet wouldn't really represent a whole lot. So even though I think checking would be totally fine, this time I decide to go for some more value, albeit quite thin. 2600 going into the middle. She doesn't snap call, which looks like good news, but she does eventually toss in a call. I turn it over and we lose to pocket eights. So not, you know, my favorite hand that I've ever played by any means, and definitely not my favorite result. In the next one, the $100 straddle is on, and I raise it up with ace four of hearts. 
three people make the call, and we flop the nut flush draw on 993 with two hearts. Considering that it's four ways, I think we should be checking quite often, or betting small occasionally with a hand like mine. This time is going to be one of those times. I put in $400 when the action checks to me, then it gets to Nate Hill on the button who elects to raise. A bit interesting considering that, like I said, we're four ways. I would expect him to mainly call in position or fold. So this raise is a little weird, but I've got an overcard and the nut flush draw. What am I going to do, right? So I make the call and we go to a turn, which comes the four of spades, giving me a pair to go along with my nut flush draw. I check it again, and this time he bets $2,200. Maybe once in a blue moon, a check raise would be cool here, but this time I just call and we go to a river, which is the seven of hearts. At this point, I consider leading for a bit, but decide against it and just check. Nate has me regretting that decision immediately as he checks back right away. I turn it over and we win. So essentially Nate played this hand perfectly and I was just chasing a draw and I got there. Next hand, the straddle is on once more. Krish opens to 300. I'm in late position with king four of diamonds, which is probably a little bit too weak to call. Should mainly fold and sometimes raise, but for whatever reason this time I decide to just call. Mike X and Turbo come along as well, so we go to a flop of four deuce deuce rainbow. Mike X does something interesting now, and he leads out of the small blind for $1,000. Both players behind him fold, but when it gets to me, I've got top pair with a great kicker, so what am I going to do, right? I make the call, and we get a great turn card. It's the king of clubs, giving me top two pair, and a very disguised top two pair, I might add. Interestingly enough, though, he now leads out for $2,500. Not really sure what he's doing this with. Perhaps an overpair on the flop like fives through nines that plays this way. Maybe some sort of draw like five three suited. I don't know. It's Mike X. He's got a few tricks up his sleeve. So even though I do think there's some value in raising, I don't want to fold out any potential bluffs he might have. So I just call and we see the 10 of diamonds on the river. Essentially a brick unless he's got pocket tens, but that seems quite unlikely for a few different reasons. So when he checks, I am certainly not checking back. Time to go for some value. The question is how much to bet. And I think for the most part in this spot, betting big makes sense, mainly because my bet either represents a very strong hand or some sort of missed draw myself, such as 6-5 suited, ace-3 suited, you know, maybe some turned flush draws, hands of that nature that come along on the flop and turn and then end up with nothing on the river and try to steal it away. However, this time I am not trying to steal it away. I've actually got something, but like I said, representing either some garbage or something strong, that means I'm gonna bet big. I throw in $11,000. Mike X does not like it one bit. Eventually, as he's thinking, he turns over his hand, and I'm surprised to see he's got six four of clubs for the flop top pair and turned flush draw. Looking back, I guess we could have raised the turn, but of course I did not know his exact holding at the time. Either way, we are now on the river and Mike X is not sure what to do. And honestly, I do not envy his spot whatsoever. This is a really tough one with 6-4. I think I would lean more towards calling in his spot, maybe folding occasionally. This time is going to be one of those times because he makes the discipline lay down and he was correct this time. Nice play, Mike X. Sadly, we do not get paid off with the big river bet. In the next one, Krish opens to 200. Ling Ling calls and I am in late position with ace five offsuit. Of course, an easy fold, but we are playing the stand-up game and there are only two players left, myself and another, who need a button to not lose the stand-up game. If you're unfamiliar with what I'm saying, that's too bad, I've explained it plenty of times. Anyway, I decide to raise it up and try to earn myself a button. I make it $1,000 to go. Krish calls, Ling Ling does not. So quite the ideal situation so far. Let's try to win this one post-flop. King 9-3 seems like a great opportunity. I can have all sorts of strong stuff on a king high board after re-raising pre-flop. So when he checks, I'm gonna continue with a small bet, much like I would with all my other holdings. I put in $700. Chris is not done with it just yet. He makes the call. Looking for some help on the turn, like a spade, perhaps a straight draw, maybe even an ace for top pair, although beggars can't be choosers. The four of hearts, qualifies for sure it's not the best card ever but hey now i've got a gut shot and like i said on the flop could still represent all sorts of strong holdings so when he checks i'm gonna elect to keep betting this time i decide to size up to 4400 bucks would also be doing this with aces ace king pocket kings 
pocket nines, king nine. You guys get the idea. So doing it with bluffs seems rational as well. An overbet is what I like to go with, and now Krish goes into the tank for quite some time. If he makes the call, he's going to have around $16,000 behind, and we're going to have to decide whether or not to go for it on the river. Of course, it's dependent on the specific river card. It turns out we'll never have to cross that bridge, though, because Krish eventually announces all-in for his remaining 16k, giving me no choice but to fold, so I do quickly, and he turns over the queen-9 offsuit for middle pair, Essentially saying, screw it, if you got it, you got it, I'm going with it. Krish has a lot of heart. Now, I did not earn myself a button, but the very next hand, I won a small pot and avoided paying the penalty, so that was quite nice. Moving on to the next interesting hand of the night, I am in the double straddle for $200, and I look down at some red pocket tens. In this one, Krish opens up the action when it folds to him to 700, and then Ling Ling in the big blind makes it 3,000 to go, so quite a lot of action before it's even my turn. And what do we do with pocket tens in this spot? Do we make the very tight fold? Do we cold call and essentially turn our hand almost face up? Or do we put in another raise and face the dreaded all-in from one of these two players? I don't know. None of the options seem too great, but I've got position. Whatever. I call. Not something I do every day, put in the cold call, but in this exact spot, I think it's more than fair. So I put in the 3,000. And Krish gets out of the way, so pretty much an ideal situation, especially so when we flop middle set on queen 10-7 with two clubs. <sighs> the stuff dreams are made of, playing questionably pre-flop and then getting there right away on a flop, that's good stuff. Unfortunately, Ling Ling does not bet. She checks it over to me. I'm going to start betting myself. She might have a hand like ace-king or maybe pocket nines that are pretty much going to give up. So I decide to bet small $2,000 and keep all her possible holdings intact. Don't want her to go anywhere just yet. And she does not. She puts in the call and we get a good turn card. It's the eight of diamonds. She checks again and now I decide to bet big, essentially just targeting hands that she is gonna go all the way with like ace queen, pocket aces, pocket kings, these sorts of hands that she might just be pot controlling with. If she's got ace king or some other weak stuff, I don't expect her to hang on to a turn bet anyway, so might as well target the good stuff. 11,000 into the middle. Now she thinks about it for quite some time, around three or four minutes before eventually folding pocket aces. That's right, Ling Ling completely owned me in this hand. I'd rather not talk about it anymore. So we're gonna go to the next one where the straddle is on, Krish opens to 300 and I make it 1000 on the button with pocket nines. Turbo cold calls from the straddle and then Krish calls as well. So three ways to a flop, in position at least, which comes five, four deuce, two diamonds. Not the best board ever for pocket nines, but pretty dang close. We've got an over pair. So when it checks to me, I decide to continue betting for half pot. And now Turbo check raises from 1500 to 3500 Just 2000 more dollars. Krish folds and already this is pretty concerning for me. Sure, it's a small check raise, but I don't think he'd be doing this with flush draws or smaller over pairs than my pocket nines. So really what I put him on are some crazy good combo draws like seven, six of diamonds, for example, or of course a flop set, which is certainly possible given that he cold called pre-flop. But then again, I've got pocket nines and we're getting a good price in position. So I'm not going anywhere just yet. I make the call and we got a terrible turn card. It's the seven of diamonds. So now any potential flush draws, of course, improve to an actual flush. And Turbo seems undeterred by this card. He announces all in for $13,000. Pretty easy fold, I think, especially without a diamond in my hand. So that's what I do. And he is kind enough to show me pocket fives for a flopped top set. Nice hand, Turbo. Moving on, I double straddle once more for $200. Early position player opens to 500. He gets three callers, and I look down at Jack-9 suited, definitely coming along with this hand, so we go five ways to a flop of queen, eight, deuce, rainbow. Not much going on for me aside from a gut shot straight draw. And what do you know when the action checks around, that's exactly what we hit. It's the 10 of spades giving me the very disguised nuts out of nowhere. When Ling Ling checks, I decide to get sneaky and check it again. Praying, fingers crossed, that someone puts in some money and we can try to build this pot through a check raise, but somehow it checks through again. Not ideal. River card is the ace of spades, meaning we don't technically have the nuts anymore, but of course still in love with my hand. Ling Ling checks once more, and of course, how can I check again, right? It's time to bet for value. 
Nope, I decide to, for a third time, check it. Mainly because someone's got to bet this card. I'm sure either someone has an ace, or maybe someone will try to represent it. And it looks like Dylan, the preflop raiser, is going to do just that. Now, whether he has it or not, I don't care. All I care about is that he is putting in $700. I'm hoping at least some people make the call, but no one does. Until it gets to Ling Ling, who goes for the check raise up to $3,500. Hmm, quite the interesting play. Does she have Jack-9-2? Maybe she's got the dreaded King-Jack, which would be a bigger straight than my own. I don't know, but of course, I am not going to fold. She could also be doing this with two pair, maybe a set. She might play those hands this way and, you know, not be afraid of any potential straights since no one's shown too much interest in this pot. So now it's a question of whether I want to raise again or just call. And even though I've got a sick hand... I don't really know if we can put in another raise and expect to get called by anything worse than my hand. So I decided to just call. Got a bad feeling about this one for some reason. Dylan thinks for a while now and also makes the call. So not really sure what everyone's got, but that mystery is solved right away as Ling Ling turns over the King Jack off suit. I muck my smaller straight and Dylan claiming he had top two pair also mucks his hand. This pot is going to Ling Ling with her King Jack. Nice hand. In the next one, the game officially changes to 25-50-100, so from here on out we are playing three blinds. Nate Hill opens up the action to 300, and then Krish makes it 900 on his direct left. Action gets all the way to me in the small blind, and finally we look down at an absolute premium after playing around eight hours. It is Pocket Kings. Happy to raise again, so I make it an additional $2,000. 2,900 to go. Nate Hill, the first raiser, he gets out of the way, but Krish, after re-raising Nate, is going nowhere just yet. He tosses in the 2k, and we go heads up to a bad flop. It's ace-queen-6 rainbow. I have pocket kings, and there's an ace out there. Sometimes could bet small, sometimes could check. This time, I decide to check it. Krish checks back, and we get the seven of clubs on the turn. Just a brick, pretty much. I check again, and this time he bets $4,000. I fold right away. I feel like he's got an ace, and uh, I was wrong. He doesn't have an ace. He's got two aces. The man turns over pocket aces, which he slow played pre-flop in hopes of getting me to stack off against him somehow post-flop, which certainly could have happened on some different boards. Not this one though. And what looked like run bad on the flop is actually a miraculous ace because it allows me to get away from these pocket kings versus pocket aces while losing less than $3,000 at a 25-50-100 game. I know I lost the pot, but that's running hot in and of itself. In the next one, we get an opportunity for redemption as early position raises to 300, and once more, I look down at pocket kings, so I raise it up to 1,000. Chris cold calls from the third blind, and their initial raiser calls as well, so we go three ways to another bad flop for pocket kings. It's ace, 10, three. <sighs> another terrible flop. When it checks to me, I decide to check it. Turn card is a brick. We check around again. River, same thing. I turn over my pocket kings and we win. Not the biggest pot ever, but we managed to win with kings this time, despite there being an ace out there. Not too shabby. And the next one, Krish opens up the button to $300. Small blind folds and I look down in the middle blind at 10-7 of diamonds. Not really a hand that's strong enough to call. I think, as you guys can probably guess, you should mostly fold and occasionally get aggressive with a hand like this. Perhaps this is a little too wide. Should be looking at hands like 10-9 suited, maybe 10-8 suited, but 10-7, a bit too optimistic. That is not going to stop me, however. I do like to mix it up when I play my own private game and give these guys some action. So I make it 1,500 to go. Krish makes the call and we go heads up to a flop of ace-4 deuce rainbow with one diamond out there. There's an ace out there. That means I could try to represent it since I re-raised pre-flop. So I make it $1,000 and Chris makes the call. Looking for a good turn card to continue bluffing and that's exactly what we get. It's the king of diamonds. Now I could just continue to represent strong stuff and of course plan B would be to make the flush on the river if he calls. In terms of sizing, I think betting very big makes the most sense here. Would also be doing this with strong stuff. So with 10 high, gotta stick to the same plan. You know, otherwise we get too predictable when playing poker. I throw in $6,000. Chris thinks about it for quite some time. And he folds. All right. Not the biggest pot ever. Not the biggest win ever. But always nice to take down a 5K pot with 10 high. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the last fun one of the night. And it's going to be another risky hand against Chris. This time I straddle for $200. 
Turbo limps in on the button, and then Krish also limps in from the small blind. I looked down at King-9 offsuit, not the strongest holding, but against a weak limp from the button, and Krish tossing in some money from the small blind, I suspect we might be able to take this one down either pre-flop or with some aggression after the flop. So I start by raising to $1,200. Turbo makes the call, which is not great. Krish also makes the call. However, the flop comes pretty good. It's Jack, Deuce, Deuce with a flush draw. I guess pretty good is open for interpretation, but the way I'm looking at it is the strongest hand anyone can have on a board like this is a jack. Since I raised pre-flop, it's unlikely anyone's got a two. So for that reason, when Chris checks to me, I'm gonna start bluffing now. Even if someone does have a jack, we could apply a lot of pressure to weak holdings like that, like jack eight suited, for example. And if any over cards to the jack come, we could use them as scare cards and try to bluff our opponents out. At least that's what I'm thinking. I don't know if any of that makes sense. It's late. I've been playing all night. I bet $1,300. Turbo gets out of the way on the button, which is nice. Krish is not done with it just yet, though. He makes the call. Hoping for a good turn card. It's the four of hearts. That's not a very good one. He checks, and I think at this point, giving up is probably the best idea. However, I do not give up. As mentioned earlier, we could try to scare our opponents off a of jack. Chris is curious. He might be calling with a middling pocket pair as well. So I decide to continue applying pressure. It's my own private game. I want to give action. You guys get the idea. I throw in $4,000 and Chris thinks for quite some time and makes the call. That's really bad. Now I've got King High going to a river. Somehow this pot is over $14,000. What am I doing? Hoping for a king and oh, no, that's not a king. It's a queen. It was close. It looked like a king at first, but it's a queen. That means I've got king high and nothing but a hope and a prayer. He checks it over to me with around $10,000 behind. And now what do we do? This is the problem with playing hands like king nine offsuit. You get yourself into these tricky situations, but I look at them like a learning experience. And at the very least, I'm well aware of when I'm playing way too loose, as is the case in this particular hand. Anyway, enough rambling. What are we gonna do? He checks it over to me, 10K behind. Should we bluff? Should we check and wave the white flag? I weigh all my options and eventually decide to bet. However, I am not going to go all in. In fact, I'm gonna bet a size that looks like a value bet. I'm hoping this will look strong to Krish and I think it will seem to him like I'm value betting an overpair or a hand like ace jack, maybe even the occasional queen. A hand like King, Queen of Diamonds, for example. Anyway, that's all that's running through my mind when I bet $6,000. The good thing about not betting too big as well is you're getting a cheaper price on your bluff, meaning this doesn't have to work too often to be profitable. But man, I really want it to work here. I'll be honest. <laughs> now Chris thinks it over for quite some time. We don't get snap called, I should say. That's always nice when you're bluffing on the river and your opponent does not snap call. But after some time, he does not look like he wants to fold either. That would be tough if he called as we're ending the night. Losing a big pot to Krish would be a bit heartbreaking, although I'd definitely survive. But then Krish starts looking like he wants to fold as well. Shaking his head, looking a bit uncomfortable. Looks like he could go either way, and he folds. <sighs> that was a close one. Luckily, we finished the night with two successful bluffs. And as always, I hope you guys enjoyed the hands. So it is two in the morning and back here, we just broke the game. It went a long time today, around 10 hours. Luckily for me, it ended up being worth it. I won around 3000 bucks or so. It's debatable whether or not that's exactly worth it, you know, but $3,000 in a day's work is more than okay with me. Unfortunately, there weren't too many interesting spots, which again, kind of, continues with the theme of my month. I just haven't played too many huge pots, but uh, that's just how it goes sometimes, you know? It's not always gonna be exciting like in the movies. This is how it is to play cash on a regular basis. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed and uh, I'm gonna go get some sleep because I'm pretty tired. So until next time, good luck at your local tables. See you guys next time.